Welcome to Cordell and Cordell's Men's Divorce Podcast, bringing you information for guys before, during, and after divorce, and everything related to family law. This podcast is not to be taken as legal advice, and no attorney-client relationship is established. Hello, and welcome to the Men's Divorce Podcast. I am Kelly Burris. I'm a senior litigation partner with the firm of Cordell & Cordell. I practice mostly out of the Austin, Texas office, but I'm licensed in Texas and Oklahoma. Been practiced for a really long time, board certified, family law, doing it a long time. Uh, I have with me today Patrick Kelly, who is also a Texas attorney, got a lot of Texas today, um, who, and we are going to talk about custody evaluations. Uh, Welcome, Patrick. Thank you. Kelly, and like yourself, I've also practiced in another jurisdiction, New York State. So my experience is not just in Texas, but also has relevance to other you know, clients and other cases in other states, New York or Oklahoma, as, as you've been practicing there, too. So I would, we'll be talking today about the child custody evaluation process, uh, both you know, preparing for it, working through it, the report itself, and then what will happen after the report anything remedial steps that need to be taken and or how to prepare for trial with your child custody evaluation. Yeah, and thank you so much for joining us, Patrick. And just uh, kind of to let you know, uh, we are not going to be offering legal advice today. uh, But if you would like some legal advice on your case and you would like to discuss your case further, please uh, contact us at 1-866-DADS-LAW or visit our website, CordellCordell.com to book an appointment with an attorney in your area. All right. Well, Patrick, let's just dive right into it and talk about some custody evaluations. All right. Well, today we're going to be talking about custody evaluations or social studies, as they're known in some jurisdictions. Uh, In case you don't know what a custody evaluation or social study is, it is uh, basically a report ordered by the court uh, to have an expert evaluate the family and the parties in the case and the children in the case and make a recommendation to the court as to what uh, that expert feels should happen in a case. For those of you who may not be familiar with that, um, we really are looking at uh, something that's ordered frequently by the courts. In a lot of cases, some jurisdictions don't use them as much. I'm in Austin. You got a lot of Texas people today. Uh, But uh, I'm in Austin and our jurisdiction doesn't tend to do custody evaluations as much. We do a lot of psychological evaluations, but there are other um, like one county over, we do them a lot more, a lot more frequently if there's a case and, and there's a contested custody case. And so the courts can either order those sort of on their own or um, parties can request them and then the court can order them. Um, so that just kind of gives you in, in a custody evaluation, just briefly what that is, is usually it's a study by a trained professional and expert that's either appointed by the court or if you're hiring someone, um, somebody who's qualified to do that and they go go in and they talk to everybody and they may do testing and other things. And then they sort of make a recommendation to the court as to whatever the issue is. So possession and access, schedule of conservatorship, like who has legal rights and duties and things like that. So Patrick, um, you know, what, I mean, when, a, when a custody evaluation is ordered, um, you know, what, I mean, what things do you think about when trying to prepare a client to go through that custody evaluation? That's a great question. And I would almost say it's not even when it's ordered, when you're contemplating it as a lawyer, a family law attorney, you want to start thinking about it before the court orders because you want to be ready. One of the most important parts of a custody evaluation, I say, is the who's the custody evaluator and be ready if that's going to be a request you make or you think the court is going to make that you have a pool of who you feel are evaluators who you could work with and who will be right for your case. So it starts right away with like, who's the right evaluator? The different factors you want to look at. Um, You know, you want obviously an evaluator who you think will be receptive to positions uh, your client may want to take. And there are factors like cost, timing, um, availability. All these factors are important. So you want to be ready to go in with alternative evaluators. So if the court is going to listen to your request or has its own inclination to appoint an evaluator, be ready with possible evaluators you think will work well in your case. And also know some jurisdictions will have evaluators they're used to working with. So you want to make sure you, if you've done your homework, know who those evaluators are. Uh, be ready to, you know, to propose alternative evaluators if you don't think you're comfortable with the ones the court may use or even opposing counsel. A lot of jurisdictions, at least in Texas, judges will ask each side for 
uh, choices for an evaluator and you'd be ready with multiple choices and be ready to have uh, advocate for your choices and advocate against ones you think may not be good for your case. Absolutely. And there's certainly pros and cons um, for every, for all different kinds of custody evaluators. And, and they, there are different types of experts that they do those too. Um, so you also want to be looking, I think, at qualifications for each of those types of experts. So I know in some jurisdictions, they'll just have, um, you know, somebody that, does social work do a custody evaluation? Whereas in other jurisdictions, you know, they'll have a licensed psych, uh, psychologist do the do the custody evaluation. I've had experiences where we have somebody that's really qualified, but they take a year and a half to do the custody evaluation. You know, they take a really, really long time or they're not very good about interviewing all of the people or looking at all of the information. So that is something you probably want to rely on your attorney to kind of give you some guidance as to, you know, who would be a good option. I'll tell you what, if I don't know, if I'm not familiar, especially within that county or that jurisdiction with um, all of the names of people who tend to do custody evaluations on, in that area, I always get you know feedback from other attorneys in the office. I think I had somebody we hired out of Dallas and I, I haven't practiced in Dallas in 14 years. <laughs> so I didn't know a lot of the people there and I got tons of feedback from our Dallas office about who would be the best fit for our case. Um, and so you really need to weigh those options. Um, and, you know, even even the best professionals, especially with custody evaluation, can certainly have bias. Um, and so you need to kind of know what you're setting up for. But like after the court orders a custody evaluation, then kind of what are your next steps and, or what what things do you tell clients to prepare themselves for, for going through that? Well, I'll often use the analogy of the a book we may have all heard of, The Art of War by Sun Tzu, you know, military tactics. And this is not a military uh, exercise here, but it is a contested case probably. And a lot of the same principles can apply. And I, I advise my clients, I say that the key principle is a lot of battles are won in preparation. It's not the battle. I mean, if you're if you get the report and then you, you're ready to go to trial and you haven't done your work and prepared for an evaluation, your chance of success won't be as great. So it really, I think, starts, Kelly, with preparing your client and preparing the evaluator, too, for your case. So, in, you know, in Texas, as you're aware, the statute lays out exactly, you know, who could be an evaluator, what their qualifications are, and generally lays out, you know, what the report should, the report is the ultimate product of the evaluation, what the report should be looking at providing information should be providing. So I think you want to start with your client and say, okay, what are your goals in the case? What are your, you know, what, you know, what, what are you trying to accomplish? Look at the statute, look at what documents you need to get, you know, to the evaluator, look at um, references you'll need to prepare, you know, to give the evaluator, do all this in advance. So you're ready to go when the evaluator steps into the case, you've got your documents that you want to provide to the evaluator. You have the, you know, referrals you want to give to the evaluator and you have all these, you know, have all this information ready and have your client prepared for the cost of the evaluation, timing of it, all these things, you know, prepare in advance even before you meet the evaluator. So when the evaluator comes into the case, you're ready to hit the ground running. Yeah, and I think um, the another really important thing to for for people clients to remember when going through this custody evaluation is just because somebody is a licensed psychologist therapist does not mean that they are your psychologist or therapist. Um, so you know, you always I I, I try to prepare clients um, to what they're going to discuss discuss with the custody evaluator. Make sure that you know they're presenting themselves. In a, in a good light, um, not using that person as a sounding board for all of the problems and concerns and issues in their life. And, and keep in mind that, you know, th this is this is all coming in front of the court. So it's kind of like, um, you know, talking to the police. It can and will be used against you in a court of law. So when and you have to have that mindset when you're going and talking to these evaluators, this person is not your therapist. Equally, I mean, you really have to watch and I have clients be really careful 
It's not a time to go in and just badmouth the other side and say how terrible and awful and horrible the other side is. And and so there's a balance there and you really have to make sure that you're presenting your concerns um, as a parent to the custody evaluator without trying to make it look like, you know, I'm just totally bashing the other side and and they're the worst parent on the planet. And, you know, because that can a lot of the times backfire. So I always kind of try to, you know, and it, it's different in every case. I mean, every case is a case by case basis. But, you know, when you're going in, I think the first and, and most important thing is to present kind of why you're a good parent. You know, what, what have you been doing with the kids? Um, how have you been sort of super mom, a super dad or super mom or whatever it is um, that that is going to qualify you to get what you want in court. And and then the the negative stuff about the other parents certainly needs to maybe be brought to the attention of the evaluator. But that should never be the first thing that you cover with in a custody evaluation in those meetings. Um, it, it really should be, you know, being excited about your kids and, and presenting in a great way that's like, you know, I love my kids so much and these are all the great things we do. Um, so those are all things that I think you have to really be careful about when you're going into that evaluation. Um, and so I always try to prepare my clients a little bit and talk about like, when you meet with this person, this is, these are kind of the priorities. Exactly. I, I agree, Kelly. And I always tell my client, you know, get, put your best face forward, you know, let them know what your goals are and whether, you know, your, your, what you've done as a parent and really, you know, try to make yourself shine. And I liked your point about, you know, bashing the other side. You know, there's a balancing act there. You want to bring attention to the evaluator, bad facts of the, of the opposing party, but it's, you have to do it in a, a very, you know, I'd say respectful or you don't want to be over the top. And as a corollary to that, I, the other important part of this too is your client probably has bad facts. And not only do you want to highlight, you know, the opposing party's bad facts, but you should get your bad facts out to the evaluator during this you know, process before you know they're going to hear the bad facts from the other side. Get in front of those bad facts, explain them, do what you can do to minimize those bad facts. You know, if the evaluator hears them from opposing party first, boy, they're going to probably lock in on them. Where if you bring them out in the light favorable to yourself and your client, then the evaluator is ready for them, has explanations, has a different understanding than being you know, caught off guard by bad facts from the other side. Absolutely. You know, those I it's always it's all about spin to some extent, um, you know, and, and making sure you get the you get the first word in and, and they hear your story first. Um, and it, the same is true with on those bad facts. Um, you know, you have to you really need to talk with your attorney about, you know, what's the best way to present those, because I think a lot of of clients going in going, I'm just going to deny, 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 deny. And that does not bode well in a lot of cases. You know, everybody's perfect. I mean, everybody's a human. No one's perfect. Um, and if you're going in trying to present this, I'm the absolute perfect parent, I think the most evaluators know that, that that's just not an accurate portrayal. Um, and then so, you know, if you're not truthful about or you're not accurate with this information, what else are you not accurate about? Um, so you've got to really kind of have that balance. And that's why it's really important to prepare with your attorney about how that's going to work and what that's what they're going to go through. That preparation starts from the intake documents that you know you're completing for the evaluator. Some evaluators have their own resources they'll give to your client to explain the process. If those evaluators don't have those resources or don't volunteer those resources, I always have resources available to explain the process to the client. You know what evaluators look at, what the courts are looking at in terms of the best interest of the children. So the client has the terminology, has the language to put in context of their, you know, working with the evaluator to put forward their best case. And, you know, it starts from intake forms, you know, what witnesses you're going to, uh, or witnesses or referrals you'll be suge suggesting to the evaluator, those witnesses, not only to your strengths, but to your weaknesses and the documents, same thing. What documents can you provide to the evaluator about your strengths? Documents that can kind of shed a better light on your weaknesses. So it's a, really in the preparation of, of all steps along the way in the process is being prepared giving the evaluator the information they need to hopefully, you know, in their report, make a recommendation that is useful to your client. 
So yeah, and so following up kind of what you mentioned before about steps in the process, let's talk a little bit about that. Um, and I know, you know, every state, every jurisdiction is different about what what a custody evaluator might do or what they're going to look at. But can you talk a little bit about kind of standard things that someone can expect, um, sort of steps in the process, what an evaluator might do or might look at um, when going through something like this? Sure. Well, the first step is probably going to be an introductory meeting and then a subsequent interview by the evaluator of your client, the children, anyone in the household, and at some point, uh, collateral witnesses. So you want to prepare your client for that interview and that, inter you know, not just substantive, but you want your client to be ready to talk about, well, geez, the evaluator spent this much time with me. This is the time they spent with the kids. These are the topics they addressed. And you want to have that information, you know, of the client thinking about that because down the road, say the report doesn't favor your client. And you may be able to talk to the evaluator and say, well, you didn't spend only this much time with my client or you only met the kids on this one occasion. So you may be able to encourage the evaluator to go back and relook at something a second time based on about the amount of time that they spent, you know, with the client. Likewise, with documents. Did the evaluator, you know, what documents do they want? Their intake forms, releases, any information they're looking for and make sure you provide that information, but also be ready to offer additional information you think would be helpful to your case along with the collateral witnesses. So you want to prep those witnesses, prep the client to be ready to, you know, go through this process to where, you know, the evaluator is going to talk to the relevant people, look at relevant documents. They're going to do their own background search. So again, this goes back to the facts. The evaluator is going to find out these bad facts most likely. So get in front of those first. Absolutely. And, and another thing that I think uh, surprises people when they're going through these evaluations is how different they are. I think a, I have a lot of clients that get confused between, you know, guardian ad litem and, and in Texas, we have amicus attorneys or attorney ad litems and then a custody evaluation. They're very, very different things. Uh, and, and in most cases, those, especially in Texas, <laughs> they may not be able to, those other folks might probably aren't going to be able to make a recommendation to the court. They're there to advocate, but they're not there to say, court, this is what I think should happen. Another, and so with that, the, it's much more in-depth and intensive as to what a custody evaluator or social study expert is going to do in that case. And I, I mean, it's frequent here that they do a lot of psychological testing. So um, MMPIs and, and um, I've had them do Rorschach testing of clients. Um, so all kinds of testing in addition to going going in and talking to everyone, know that the evaluator is going to not only interview the kids and the parties, but also may will likely go into the home in many cases and do an observation in the home or do an observation where they're just watching, you know, the parent interact with the children and how that works. Um, because ultimately, you know, if they don't have that background and they don't have all of that information, they're probably not going to make a very accurate recommendation to the court. Um, and you, as you mentioned, the, um, you know, when it doesn't go well uh, and, and may not come back in your favor, you know, in your client's favor in the, in the, the way that you want it to go. You know, those are all things that we need to be looking for to make sure that the evaluator has done those things. And if they haven't done those things, then, you know, arguing to the court, how reliable is that evaluation really? Um, and so talk a little bit also, Patrick, about like how important are these custody evaluations when they are done? How important are those in the case? Can it really make a huge difference? Is it is that the be all and end all? Can you overcome an evaluation if it doesn't go in your direction? A, you know, it's a great point and a great question. That's why I tell my clients, unfortunately, the courts will follow them sometimes to the letter. And other judge, know your judge. Some judges are more flexible and, and are more open to alternative, you know, uh, positions and arguments than those espoused by the evaluator. So you have to know your judge and you have to kind of know your evaluator. And I've had cases too where I, I didn't like necessarily the final recommendation of the evaluator, but the evaluator did a really good report. So I ended up, you know, really complimenting the evaluator, talking about a thorough investigation they did and all the, you know, all the great work they did and really highlight the things that were positive for my client. And then I kind of somewhat subtly attacked the, uh, the conclusions and said, geez, these are great facts, did a great investigation, but why wasn't this conclusion reached here? Or what did you consider here? And why not consider this? So I think there ways, even if you don't have the, maybe the right recommendation or the entire aspect of the recommendation is not what you were looking for. There are ways to still work with what the report and work with the evaluator to kind of 
put the case in the best light for your client. Yeah, and it, it, it is also things that you can consider. I know you, you know, most parties are already spending so much money on a custody evaluation. Um, but if it doesn't go your route, your direction, I mean, certainly there's further work that can be done to poke holes in that custody evaluation. I sometimes will have clients if, if they're really unhappy with it and they want to continue to fight it, especially if we felt like it wasn't maybe the fairest um, recommendation, um, we'll go in and hire an expert to do a rebuttal. Um, of that evaluator um, and really look at what all they did. We'll subpoena records from the evaluator to figure out and, you know, everything that they looked at, how much time they spent, their notes. Um, depositions can usually be important in those cases as well uh, because there are questions that you're not going to know the answer to that might benefit you at trial. So, for example, I had a, an evaluation, this was years and years ago, that didn't go our way, and we deposed the, um, the custody evaluator. And during that deposition, because you ask things in a deposition that you do, wouldn't ask at trial, because you're trying to get that information, um, you know, how many times do you recommend, or do you, it, how many custody evaluations have you done? And in all of those custody evaluations, how many times have you recommended that the kids, uh, that dad, get primary conservatorship of the kids or primary of the kids. And, you know, they, they, they'd done like 35, 40 recommendations. And ultimately they had two where they'd recommend a dad. And so that's information that we can use at trial that really makes, you know, really kind of pokes holes. And, and there is bias in a lot of these custody evaluators. Another one, you know, the evaluator said in deposition, well, I just think little kids need the mom. And so no matter what we were going to do, this evaluator was going to recommend mom as primary because they had that bias. And so there are things, and I think sometimes, you know, getting the advice of your attorney as to what the next steps are, if it doesn't go your, your direction, um, not maybe just giving up because <laughs> I've oh. certainly seen cases, you know, it is, it's very important. A lot of the times the courts will a hundred percent follow almost down to the letter what the evaluator will do, but that's not every case. No. Um, and, and I have had cases where the, the judges absolutely did not do what the custody evaluator recommended. I've had those cases too. And I've had cases where, you know, you're able to working with your client, if the recommendation is not what you're hoping for, I think it should be, to, you know, you may not be able to turn it all the way around, but you may move the evaluator, you know, at the trial closer to where you want to be. The evaluator may reconsider certain facts, look at, you know, evidence in a different way, and maybe not completely, you know, do a flip-flop, but then moves closer to where your client wants. And I think your point, Kelly, about, you know, just stop at the evaluation. Get the documents that the evaluator used, whether you subpoena them or just ask them for the evaluator. See what they base their recommendations on. See who they talk to you know, what information they provided. So that may be helpful in your case. And also I've had cases where both sides, the evaluator may recommend certain testing or certain counseling, jump on that right away. You know, if the evaluator thinks something is amiss or counseling may help, you know, don't wait till the court makes a decision, get that involved in that counseling right away. You know, go there, take some drug testing. Do what you ever need to do to allay the fears of the evaluator. Maybe when the ultimate time comes, the fact finder, whether it's a jury or whether it's you know, the judge, you're ready to maybe have that evaluator look at things differently. Yeah. And, and a lot of the times, you know, we'll get these custody evaluations and then we won't go to trial for months. Um, and so that's another thing that you, you mentioned, you know, going to therapy or getting I've had cases turn around on that because the evaluator made a recommendation. And then clients, you know, kind of followed the recommendation of the evaluator for therapy and other things. And then it, it you know, we, we have an update later on and it, and it goes a little bit different. So is that something? So say, you know, you get your custody evaluation and, you know, what, first of all, what things are you really looking for in that evaluation? And then two, if it's something got missed or got forgotten, you know, what, do, or, or it's been a long time since it's been completed, what do you do in that case? Well, and then we can speak about Texas. Texas is very statutory uh, uh, regarding what they're looking for in evaluation. And if the evaluator didn't comply with the code and didn't comply with the requirements of the code, you can say, well, the evaluator missed here or they missed there. But as you said, too, it's not just what the evaluator missed. It's maybe something your client missed. And if they did the counseling or did some testing or did some follow-up, then you can ask, as you mentioned, Kelly, maybe a couple months have gone by. You can ask the evaluator to update the report. 
Maybe they issue a new report. Maybe they may change some or all the recommendations based upon, you know, new information provided to them. And again, facts may change in the three or four months or maybe longer between the evaluation completion and your final trial. Maybe some bad facts that weren't there initially have developed and you can use those facts or change of circumstances to hopefully use as fuel to get the evaluator to reconsider their report, reconsider their recommendations and, you know, hopefully get that evaluator to look at things new. Yeah. And so in preparing for trial, when after you get that report, um, what are things as an, as an attorney that you're looking for in that report and what are you, how do you prepare both your client and the, and pre prepare to present that report at trial? Right. The report can kind of give you a roadmap of what, you know, issues will be at trial and it gives you an indication of what the witnesses, you know, both in, that you called or that you provided to the evaluator and the witnesses the other side use. So it kind of gives you a little witness preparation. It also allows you what documents were provided, you know, what documents weren't provided or what documents weren't requested. And then you could make sure you have the documents that are needed that either you review the ones that were provided or the ones that you have access to and, and documents that are relevant you didn't have access to, subpoena those documents. You, like you said, Kelly, depositions are great tools. You may want to depose a witness. You may want to depose an evaluator. So you use the evaluation as a sort of roadmap to, okay, this is where this court may be looking. What documents did they look at? What documents do you need to give that are additional documents that maybe weren't considered? What, what witnesses or what referrals, what collaterals weren't talked to by the evaluator? And should they have been? And maybe that additional information, either at trial or in a supplemental report, may help. But the roadmap, I think, is really is the evaluation for you know, preparation, documents, witnesses, and, you know, you use those tools to say, okay, this is where we need to move forward at litigation at the trial to, again, advocate for your client and to get the result your client's hoping to get. Yeah, and I think that's really important. Uh, another issue that I see in a lot of these custody evaluations is I, I think clients think that it's going to be very black and white. They're either going to really win or really lose on a lot of these evaluations. Um, and I, I, I rarely see that an, an evaluator comes down really hard on one side or the other. So a lot of times it doesn't it doesn't feel satisfying. Um, and that's court. That's family court. You know, that's, I think, a little bit of taste of, of what we see a lot in family courts. But, you know, in looking at that, when that evaluation comes down, when that uh, comes down and you're reading through it, um, you know, usually there's good and bad stuff about both sides. And a lot of the times these evaluator, evaluators split the baby on stuff um, and there's good stuff and there's bad stuff. And so, you know, it, even if it doesn't completely come down your way or the other side's way, I mean, usually there's stuff that the other side doesn't want that is being recommended. And so they can be, I think, used for settlement purposes as well to kind of go, well, hey, we know that the court is going to really heavily weigh what this evaluator said, and we don't really want that. So where can we negotiate to find some some good common ground? I would, yeah, that's very probative. I was just going to go there. It's, it, it is a good settlement tool also. You kind of had a good idea of the case, the facts, both sides kind of put their cases forward. You have an idea the judge will most likely heavily consider the recommendation of the evaluator. Now's the time to explore settlement. Can the case be settled? And it's a, it's a good way to, you know, avoid the expense and uncertainty of a trial would be to go through the uh, mediation process or arbitration process, whatever your jurisdiction has, and try to reach a settlement that may not be exactly what you want, but maybe better than rolling the dice with a unfavorable report from an evaluator. So use that evaluation as a means to settle the case on the best terms available to your client. So now going full circle back to the beginning, um, you know, when you have now that we've kind of talked about what you can expect in a custody evaluation, what do you talk to what or how do you talk to clients about when they're thinking about asking for a custody evaluation, whether or not they should get those, whether they should ask the court for it? What are considerations that you're talking over with your clients to even make a decision to request one in the first place? Right. One of the biggest considerations I use is like what information would be available to the court without the evaluation uh, and, and can that information be you know, presented to the judge without an evaluation. And one of the most important things I look at is, is child testimony. Sometimes it's very difficult 
for the court to hear the, you know, what the wishes of the child are if the child is very young or, or younger. And uh, the evaluator can talk to the child, can talk to all relevant people. So that's a one consideration I always use to say, hey, if the child's younger and the court may not hear their voice at a trial, it's a great opportunity for the child to be heard in the evaluation process. And that information can then be given to the, to the judge. Uh, there's a lot of hearsay evidence that may not be admissible at a trial, but if it's part of an evaluation, then that hearsay becomes, you know, it can usually get into evidence to some degree. And again, information that may not be available without the evaluation now becomes available to the judge through the tool of a, of a child custody evaluation. So there, you have to know your case, know your facts, you know, know, know where you're trying to go with your case and what information you need to get to the judge. And the evaluation home study may be the best tool to get that before the court if you'll have troubles getting proof, evidence that, that may not be hard to get. The evaluator has access to the information, can include it in their report, and then you get it before the judge that would be hard to do without the evaluation. Yeah, and I find in modification cases where we're trying to get a previous order changed, they're really helpful usually as a tool. Um, and then, or if parties have been separated a long time because no one is going to get a window. Like me as the attorney, I'm not going to get a window into what's going on in the opposing yes. uh, opposing party's home. And the only thing we're relying on a lot of the times is, like you said, what the kids are saying. So, you know, the kids are coming and saying, well, hey, dad, you know, at mom's house, I'm really miserable, or I have this going on or that going on. And we can't get that into evidence. But if we have a custody evaluation, it's really, they're going to go in, that evaluator is going to look at what's going on in that home and really kind of figure out what the issue is. And, and I also, a lot of the times will say, you know, really kind of judge, like, how much do we have to lose if it goes negative? So if it doesn't go in our direction, you know, where is that going to be, you know, do we kind of have nowhere to go but up, <laughs> you know? Um, and, and that's a big, big play in it too, that the cost and expense, they tend to be about fifteen twenty thousand dollars $20,000 now um, for a custody evaluation, have an expert, and sometimes they can be more. And of course, it depends on exactly what they're doing, what they're looking at. I know some jurisdictions don't go as in depth on those, um, but you know those are all really good considerations to to think about with custody evaluations. So, just kind of in closing, is there anything else that you uh, can advise or that you can well uh, uh, tell people about what you know you your experience with custody evaluations and things they should be thinking about? Well, again, if you're if you feel you're judged. And, you know, different surveys have happened and, and different, you know, you talk to other lawyers in your jurisdiction, does a judge have a certain proclivity uh, favoring a certain parent over another type of parent, as you mentioned, you know, does it, does the same way an evaluator may have certain biases, does a judge have a certain bias? And then if you feel the, the judge in that jurisdiction just is not going to be a judge that really thinks as a father, as a primary parent, it's somewhat able to take that decision out of the judge's hands to a, to a certain degree by having an expert come in who's done a thorough investigation and makes these recommendations, which you hopefully are favorable to your client. And now the judge is kind of, you know, now it's going to have to say, geez, I've got an expert here saying X, you know, will the judge follow X? And I think that happens a lot where a judge left to their own devices may not be as receptive to certain things that your client has done and certain things they hear in a case where the evaluator may look at these things differently and, and put your client in a better position than a judge may look at that, your client. Absolutely. Well, Patrick, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, I hope this was very insightful for everyone. Um, and if you need some further advice or you'd like to talk to an attorney about your case, as I mentioned before, uh, please visit us at cordellcordell.com or call us at 1-866-DADS-LAW to schedule an appointment with an attorney in your area.